Want the freshest cup of coffee in Gettysburg? Then visit Bantam Roasters, formerly 82 Cafe at 82 Steinware Avenue. They roast all of their coffee in-house, and they have a full coffee bar to keep you caffeinated during your trip. Visit them at www.raggededgerc.com for their menu and shipping options for all of their freshly roasted coffee. Use promo code HANCOCK for 10% off your order in the cafe. The 1863 civilians of Gettysburg were reluctant witnesses to the great battle. Join Ken Rich, the man in the red shirt, for his historic town walking tours. You could book these tours by emailing ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com. That's ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com. And when you're in town, look for the guy in the red shirt. Enjoy historical stories on the History Fix platform. Explore movies, short films, and documentaries. Addressing Gettysburg podcast fans receive an extra $5 off the first year's annual subscription. Sign up at historyfix.com and use promo code Gettysburg. Every subscription includes a seven-day risk-free trial. Escape into history with History Fix. This episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you in part by me, audiobook narrator Mike Scott. Narrator of Savas Beatty's Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864, and unlike anything that ever floated, the Monitor and Virginia and the Battle of Hampton Roads. If you are an author or publisher interested in having your titles produced as audiobooks, or even just in learning more about the process, give me a shout. You can find my contact info on my website, mikescottvoice.com. That's mikescottvoice.com. And Civil War Trails. It's the world's largest open-air museum, and they offer over 1,300 sites across six states. Drive the Gettysburg Campaign turn by turn, paddle to Frederick Douglass's birthplace, or hike to remote earthworks and artillery positions. Visit CivilWarTrails.org to request a brochure and explore their interactive map. Follow Civil War Trails and create some history of your own. All free episodes of Addressing Gettysburg are brought to you by our sponsors and our patrons over at Patreon.com slash Addressing Gettysburg. To become a sponsor, send an email to matt at addressinggettysburg.com. And to be a patron, go to patreon.com slash addressinggettysburg today. And we thank you in advance. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? It was 70 degrees like two days ago, wasn't it? It's a good day to talk uh, about a parka and a winter visit, I think. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome here to uh, Gettysburg National Military Park. My name is Dan Vermilia. I am a park ranger at Eisenhower National Historic Site. And uh, once again, it's an honor and a privilege to be here with everyone. Uh, Thank you to Chris Gwynn and the Gettysburg staff for inviting us back again this year. Um, I always look forward to speaking at this series. I always look forward to seeing so many uh, friendly and familiar faces here. It's a nice way to kind of start off our interpretive year here in Gettysburg. Uh, So I'm really thrilled to be here today. And very excited about uh, doing a different topic uh, this year. Um, A number of the lectures in the series this winter have been untold stories, or maybe stories that don't get as much telling as we think they should. And that is the story that we have today, most certainly. A story that has to do with this coat right here. One we'll talk about more uh, in just a moment. When you hear the word crusade, what do you think of? What comes to mind? Well, if we're talking about Dwight Eisenhower and his life, uh, I think this image comes to mind for so many individuals. The Great Crusade from Eisenhower's D-Day Order of the Day, an order given to uh, the soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force just hours before they embarked upon the invasion of Normandy, beginning the liberation of Western Europe. This famous image taken June 5th of 1944, the same day that uh, Order of the Day was given. We think of Ike talking with the paratroopers of the 101st Airborne. We see Eisenhower here putting these men at ease using a personal and empathetic leadership style. But in Eisenhower's life, the invasion of Normandy was far from his only crusade. Uh, In his own words, there were other crusades that he went on, including one that has to do with this item we have here in front of the theater. June 6, 1944 was not his only crusade. He was on another one in December of 1952. Pictured here with members of the 3rd Infantry Division in Korea wearing the same jacket that you see before you in the front of the theater. 
Eight years after D-Day, Eisenhower, who by then owned a beautiful farm here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, was president-elect of the United States, and he embarked on a 10,000-mile journey, a secret 10,000-mile journey. His mission was seeking peace in a war that many feared would spiral into World War III. And on this trip to Korea, he was armed with his experiences, his intuition, his knowledge, his desire to see the situation for himself. And once he got there, this parka. He was on a crusade for peace, as he termed it himself. This is such a fascinating topic because it's just not one that we think about a whole lot with Dwight Eisenhower. Even at the Eisenhower National Historic Site, we interpret many decades of the Eisenhower's lives, and, and there's so much focus on his World War II career, but he was so deeply involved in the Korean War. It was such an important chapter of his life. And moreover, his trip to Korea, when this picture was taken, when he was wearing this parka, it's a perfect uh, example of his leadership style. It's a perfect example of his belief system, what he valued. And in a town where we focus so intensely on combat, here's the story of a famed leader, a general who traveled halfway around the world trying to find a way to end a conflict. So our program today is exploring Dwight Eisenhower and the Korean War. Specifically, we're looking at his trip to Korea in December of 1952. We're going to ask a couple key questions. How did this former general, who again had just bought a retirement home here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, how does he come to go to Korea in 1952? What happened on his trip? We're going to take a deep dive look at what Eisenhower actually did in Korea and why his trip and this park of this item, the newest item, uh, one of the newest items in the Eisenhower National Historic Sites collection, why this story matters. And I should pause and say that we uh, have this item on display, this, this beautiful parka jacket that Eisenhower wore in Korea. Uh, you get the inside tag here. See right there, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Korea, 1952. Um, we have this item thanks to the generosity of our partners, the Gettysburg Foundation. And uh, lately it's been on display in a case just outside of this theater near our Eisenhower exhibit in the Visitor Center. Uh, right after the program, it will go back in the case. It's not like anybody's going to be in the theater watching the film and this is still going to be there. Don't worry about it. Uh, we're going to put it back in the case. If folks would like to come up and have a, have a close look at the item after the program, you're more than welcome to. Just uh, would have to remind you not to touch the object, not to touch the artifact. But uh, it's, it's going to be on display here in the Visitor Center through July, um, because this winter marks the 70th anniversary of Eisenhower's trip to Korea, and this coming July marks the 70th anniversary of the armistice in Korea and the end of uh, the active phase of that conflict. Another question we're going to consider is, is how we serve um, the various ways that we do this. This lecture is not a history of the Korean War, but rather it's a story about Dwight Eisenhower stepping out of his path towards retirement on his crusade for peace, again pictured here in Korea in December of 1952. And his trip there, the trip that we're going to be exploring and examining here today, as AP reporter Don Whitehead would say, these were three fateful days for Korea and for the world. So how do we get here? How do we have this former general who, again, has this beautiful farm in Gettysburg. If I were Ike, I would want to be in Gettysburg at this retirement home. How does he come to be in Korea? Well, there's some backstory we have to do here about Eisenhower and about Korea as well. If you're going to understand Eisenhower, you have to understand that West Point was a very important chapter in his life for a variety of reasons. The words duty, honor, country were not just a mantra for Eisenhower, they were words that he lived by. He was a duty-bound individual in service of his country in all times. As he would write about his time at West Point, starting at the Academy, of taking the oath, when we raised our right hands and repeated the official oath, there was no confusion. A feeling came over me that the expression, the United States of America, would now and henceforth mean something different than it ever had before. From here on, it would be the nation I would be serving, not myself. Suddenly, the flag itself meant something. Pictured here are Eisenhower and members of his West Point class, May of 1915 on the steps of Christ Lutheran Church here in Gettysburg, Eisenhower's first time visiting Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And that oath, that allegiance to his country, duty, honor, country, those words guided his life from his first visit to Gettysburg, his next time here, 1918, Camp Colt, 
They guided him all around the world to the Philippines, to Panama, to Normandy, to VE Day. And in the summer of 1945, 30 years later, Eisenhower is this victorious figure. He's one of the most admired men in the world, one of the most respected men in the country. He comes home. He's being uh, received by the president, President Truman, there in June of 1945. And that same month, he had given a speech, uh, the Guildhall Address in London, where he spoke about his successes and the victory that had happened in World War II, but he also provided a great window into his insight. And I, I use this quote a lot in talks because I think it's so, so meaningful for understanding who Dwight Eisenhower was as a leader. Humility must also always be the portion of any man who received acclaim earned in the blood of his followers and the sacrifices of his friends. Conceivably, a commander may have been professionally superior. He may have given everything of his heart and mind to meet the spiritual and physical needs of his comrades. He may have written a chapter that will glow forever in the pages of military history. Still, even such a man, if he existed, would sadly face the fact that his honors cannot hide in his memories, the crosses marking the resting places of the dead. They cannot soothe the anguish of the widow or the orphan whose husband or whose father will not return. Eisenhower was acutely aware that his own successes came because of the sacrifices of others. And that was a guiding principle. That was uh, a guiding principle for him throughout his life and definitely uh, in, in his trip to Korea, as we will talk about here. He knew all too well that his honors could not hide the memories of crosses marking the resting places of those who died under his command, such as those buried here at the Henri Chapelle Cemetery in Belgium. And there are cemeteries all around the world that have American soldiers, American service members who fell under the command of Dwight D. Eisenhower. Our very own town of Gettysburg has one, Gettysburg National Cemetery. Over 590 World War II fallen are buried there, and as we'll see later on in this program, some who fell in Korea are buried there as well. Service members who served and died in conflicts from the Civil War through Vietnam are buried in Gettysburg National Cemetery. And this cemetery just so happens to be just a stone's throw away from this beautiful farm that Eisenhower was drawn to. In 1950, the Eisenhowers were looking ahead to the next stage in their lives. He's still this victorious, successful leader, but he's thinking about retirement after several decades on the move. In December of 1943, he wrote a letter to Mamie. Uh, when this hectic war is over, I often wonder whether anyone who has carried heavy responsibilities, has had to jump constantly from hither to thither, can really settle down and live a serene life. I know that when I find myself contemplating a post-war existence, I always picture a little place far from cities. Well, less than a decade later, he's kind of describing this farm that the Eisenhowers would come to find here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. They see the property in the fall of 1950, they fall in love with the place, they put a down payment down. At the time, Eisenhower was the head of Columbia University, he was serving there from 1948 uh, to 1950 as his way of continuing his public service just in the arena of education. After World War II, he had been the chief of staff of the Army for several years before going to Columbia. But as he would write in his memoir, my time or world events determined that my career at Columbia University would be short. And those world events bring us to our main topic of our lecture, Korea. There's a Korean proverb, a shrimp is crushed in the battle of the whales. And that is a, a proverb that speaks to the history of the Korean peninsula and the Korean people in so many different ways. For us in the United States, we refer to this, the Korean War, as America's Forgotten War, and it largely is. That's one thing I've discovered in uh, researching this topic and looking for books is there's a lot fewer books out there on the Korean War than there are on the Second World War. As historian David Halberstam wrote, Korea was a small, proud country that had the misfortune to lie in the path of three infinitely larger, stronger, more ambitious powers, China, Japan, and Russia. Japan had been occupying Korea since the Russo-Japanese War of 1905. Korea was formally annexed in 1910. And during World War II, there were discussions amongst the Allied powers of restoring the Korean Peninsula to the Korean people. Uh, that Korea shall become a free and independent country once again. But in 1945, with the Soviets throwing their hat in the ring to fight against the Japanese in the uh, waning weeks of World War II, a dividing line was determined in Korea as a stopping point for U.S. and Soviet forces. Sound familiar anywhere else? Well, that dividing line was the 38th parallel. 
The southern half had 16 million, the northern half had 9 million. And over the coming years, while there was discussion about trying to find ways of uniting the peninsula, uh, to very little surprise, the Americans and the Soviets just could not agree on that. They very, very quickly became a focal point in the growing, uh, very quickly growing Cold War. Each side ended up having their own self-appointed leaders. For the South, it was Syngman Rhee. For the North, it was Kim Il-sung. And in June of 1950, with uh, Soviets egging him on, Kim Il-sung and the North Koreans attacked over the border and invaded into South Korea, beginning the Korean War. Quickly, the United States and UN forces committed troops. And in the early months of this conflict, U.S. and U.N. forces were pushed very quickly down south on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the United States Army was not well prepared for this conflict at all. By September, there was a landing behind communist lines at Incheon, and U.S. and U.N. forces began pushing north. Again, we're not doing a detailed history of the Korean War here, just some, some brief background for our story to understand how Eisenhower gets involved. By November of 1950, it's looking like this drive to the Yalu River to take over the entire Korean Peninsula, uh, to take over North Korea and restore it as, as one free and independent country is well on its way, right up until China gets involved and throws hundreds of thousands of troops into the foray. This is when late November of 1950, the famous Battle of the Chosin Reservoir happens uh, in the brutal Korean winter. All this happening with uh, General Douglas MacArthur in command of UN forces. Uh, MacArthur pushing north, assuring United States and UN officials that China certainly would not get involved in the conflict just as China was getting involved in the conflict. So what does this have to do with Dwight Eisenhower? Well, as this is taking place, Dwight and Mamie are falling in love with their home here in, in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, with this property they've seen, uh, getting ready to put the down payment on this farm. In the fall of 1950, a lot of things are happening in President Harry Truman's administration. With fears over Chinese and Soviet aggression, Truman turns to familiar faces. September 12th, he goes to Leesburg and asks George Marshall to be his Secretary of Defense. Marshall would say something to the effect of, when the President comes and asks you to do that in your own home, you're kind of at a disadvantage. You got to do that. A couple weeks later, Truman asks Eisenhower to become the NATO commander. Now, this is why uh, things are happening in Korea. Why NATO? Well, there's worries about Soviet aggression in Europe over the post-war peace holding just five years after victory. Now, in these next couple weeks, Eisenhower, if you read his letters, his diaries, he's uh, getting a very, very clear sense that he's going to be back in service once again. The day after Truman asked him to be NATO commander, he says, as of this moment, I would estimate that the chances are about 9 out of 10 that I will be back in uniform in a short time. On November 9th, the Gettysburg Times notes that Dwight Eisenhower may soon be back in Europe. Eisenhower himself said, I may possibly be in Europe soon for whatever military duty that might be in store for me. He went on to say, I am a soldier and I'll serve wherever I am asked to serve. Duty, honor, and country. That same month of November, there's newspaper reports about the Eisenhowers being interested in a farm here in Gettysburg. The New York Times says on November 21st that a down payment was put down. And again, this is happening just as Chinese troops are becoming involved in the Korean War. The attack begins at the Chosin Reservoir on November 27th. Days later, December 5th, in his diary, Eisenhower writes, the Korean situation is tragic. It's looking like this might blossom into World War III. He said he believed that MacArthur could still stabilize the situation, but it would require drawing back south towards the 38th parallel to stabilize UN forces. He went on to write, something is terribly wrong. In the midst of this, President Truman declares a national emergency on December 16th, calling upon the American people to work together in concert to meet this threat in Korea, to pull together and mobilize the country much as we had done five years before. Three days later, Eisenhower is officially declared NATO commander. And the day after that, December 20th, the headline in the Gettysburg Times, Eisenhower's will not move here, January 1st. And this quote from Mamie breaks my heart. We had hoped we had reached the age when we could settle down. 
Put yourself in their shoes. <clears throat> this is the reverse of 1918, by the way. 1918 at Camp Colt, Eisenhower wants to be in France getting combat experience in the Great War, World War I. And where is he sent instead? Gettysburg. Right? Now he's being sent to France, and where does he want to be? <laughs> the story in the Gettysburg Times on the 20th was side by side with a headline about the communist offensive in Korea. 1951 finds Eisenhower serving as the head of NATO. Eisenhower wrote in a letter in January of 1951, NATO needs an eloquent and inspired Moses as much as it needs planes, tanks, guns, and ships. And here is NATO's Moses. Ike's job was to get the coalition together to provide some leadership, get people to work together in this, this coalition of countries. He wrote, our problem is one of selling and inspiring. And he's the perfect guy for it because he had done it in Europe once already. Now, during this time, Eisenhower is disagreeing with President Truman on several matters, on a lot of matters, really, but he's very quiet. He's not going to publicly say anything because he is serving in a position as NATO commander where if he's saying things that are uh, negative about the president, it's going to reflect very, very poorly on both parties. And that's also just not who Eisenhower was. But as he is serving as the head of NATO, the war in Korea is raging on. <clears throat> U.S. and U.N. forces are struggling to stabilize the front. Matthew Ridgway assumed command of the U.S. 8th Army on December 26th after the death of General Walton Walker. <clears throat> and the front lines are changing rapidly, multiple times. By March of 1951, the U.S. 8th Army reclaimed Seoul. And with all of this going on, uh, the conflict's going to be unstable on the front lines, and it's also going to be unstable from a command situation. Pictured here in the aviators, one Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur, as the overall commander in Korea, was encouraging Truman to bring nuclear weapons into the conflict, advocating for taking the air war to China directly. And he's rebuking Truman publicly for not directly bombing the Chinese, violating the chain of command and decorum on so many different levels. And thus he is fired in April of 1951 with General Ridgway here taking over as UN commander. At this time, Eisenhower told someone uh, who encouraged him not to speak out on MacArthur's firing. This is one of my favorite Eisenhower quotes I've come across. I'm going to be using this to some of my colleagues here. I'll be using this in some staff meetings, I think. <laughs> I assure you that I'm going to maintain silence in every language known to man on MacArthur's firing. Love that quote. Ike was a man of few words, but he had some gems in him. With MacArthur taking over again, the front is slowing to a static front near the 38th parallel, as David Halberstam would write of the war in the summer of 51. It became a war of cruel, costly battles, of few breakthroughs, and of strategies designed to inflict maximum punishment on the other side without essentially changing the battle lines. In the end, there would be no great victory for anyone, only some kind of mutually unsatisfactory compromise. That same year, 1951, negotiations begin between UN and communist forces in Panmunjom. Initially, they take place in a separate city, Kaesong. They move to Panmunjom in late 1951. And there are several points that are being discussed, but for context here, the negotiations that bring about the armistice begin in 1951 when Eisenhower is NATO commander. And in the midst of all of this, Eisenhower is watching from Europe, and he's contemplating some different decisions of his own, whether or not he will become a reluctant candidate for president of the United States. As I said, he's disagreeing with President Truman on some matters of how the war is being waged. He thinks the Truman administration was partially responsible for, for this war happening in the first place, for not maintaining proper military readiness. And he's very worried over the Republican Party with Senator Robert Taft, an isolationist who is not a fan of NATO and told Ike as much before Eisenhower went over to become NATO commander. He's worried about Taft becoming the Republican nominee and potentially the next president of the United States. Eisenhower had been encouraged to run for president for many years at this point. It really picks up in 1951 with the amount of chaos and the amount of things going on on the global stage. 
In September, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge goes to Paris and encourages Eisenhower to run. Eisenhower is non-committal, non -committal, but he's beginning to think about it and entertain the fact. In October of 1951, William Robinson of the New York Herald Tribune wrote an editorial encouraging Eisenhower to run, noting at rare intervals in the life of a free people, the man and the occasion meet. Essentially, what's going to happen is Eisenhower's friends and supporters, with a few winks and nods from Ike himself, are going to begin a shadow campaign for him back here in the United States while Eisenhower was still in Europe. Ike will see this desire for him to run. He's fearing what will happen if he doesn't step in. And ultimately, that's what leads him to agree to run for President of the United States in 1952. He comes home in the spring of 1952. The campaign's kicked off in Abilene. One, one too soon here. This is his campaign kickoff here in Abilene, June 4th of 1952. A couple days later, he has a big rally here in Gettysburg has a bunch of Republican delegates at his farm where he's starting to work the delegates, trying to swing them over to his, his point of view. He's having meetings with them, and these delegates keep asking General Eisenhower, what do you think about Korea? It's the top issue in the country. In 1952, now this, this war is just bogged down into a stalemate, though we're still losing American soldiers over there. What are you going to do? And Eisenhower is saying, I don't quite know yet. That summer, the Republican convention is in Chicago. And Eisenhower's supporters, some of them are wearing buttons that say K1, C2. Korea 1 being the first issue. And the next two issues Eisenhower would tackle were corruption in government and communism, and communists in the government even. Now at the Republican convention, there is a fight. As Senator Henry Cabot Lodge had told Eisenhower, the true fight, if he decided to run, would be in getting the nomination. It wouldn't be the general election. It would be in getting the nomination and winning over the Republican Party. Well, thanks to his friends and supporters, with Henry Cabot Lodge chief among them, Eisenhower's team pulls through with parliamentary rules and procedures and winning over delegates to Eisenhower's case. MacArthur himself spoke at the convention, uh, thinking that perhaps he might even be the candidate, but that was not going to happen by the summer of 1952. As uh, David Halberstam would write, if there was going to be a general called to political office in 1952, it would be Eisenhower, not MacArthur. Eisenhower was the more egalitarian man, a better listener, and a better compromiser. July 11th of 1952, Dwight Eisenhower accepts the nomination, the Republican nomination for president of the United States. And his nominating speech, his acceptance speech, largely steered clear of Korea. Now, the Democratic nominee was Adlai Stevenson, the governor of, governor of Illinois. As much as uh, Lodge had predicted, the fight was in the nomination, not the election. So much so that by late October, Eisenhower pretty much has this thing wrapped up already. And he begins to turn his attention from campaigning to governing. October 24th, 1952, Dwight Eisenhower gives a speech in Detroit, Michigan, one that would set up our trip to Korea. In the speech, he said, in this anxious autumn for America, one fact looms above all others in our people's mind. One tragedy challenges all men dedicated to the work of peace. One word shouts denial to those who foolishly pretend that ours is not a nation at war. This fact, this tragedy, this word is Korea. It has been the burial ground for 20,000 American dead. It has been another historic field of honor for the valor and skill and tenacity of American soldiers. He goes on to say that the first task of a new administration will be to review and examine everything that we've done in Korea thus far. And the only way to do that is a personal trip to Korea. I shall make that trip. Only in that way could I learn how best to serve the American people in the cause of peace. I shall go to Korea. And in his closing here, he uses that word we talked about at the start, crusade. What you see here, the speech from October 24th of 52 and a copy of Eisenhower's Order of the Day. You're about to embark on the Great Crusade from June 6th of 1944. Eight years later, he says, in this trial, my testimony of a personal kind is quite simple. A soldier all my life, I have enlisted in the greatest cause of my life, the cause of peace. I do not believe it is a presumption for me to call the effort of all who have enlisted with me a crusade. 
And here's how Eisenhower viewed it as a crusade. I use that word only to signify two facts. First, we are united and devoted to a just cause of the purest meaning to all mankind. Second, we know that for all the might of our effort, victory can come only with the gift of God's help. In this spirit, humble servants of a proud ordeal, we do soberly say, this is a crusade. Well, shortly afterwards, Eisenhower wins, and he wins big, 442 electoral votes. Right after the election, Eisenhower goes to Augusta, Georgia, one of his favorite places, and he begins planning out what he's going to do. He begins planning out his presidential cabinet, and he also begins planning this trip that he had just publicly told everybody he was going to take if he won. Now, to President Truman's credit, uh, he offered Eisenhower the use of his presidential plane, the Independence, to take to Korea. But Eisenhower said, any old plane will do. I don't, need, uh, I don't need the official presidential plane. Now, if you're a member of the Secret Service, what's the last thing you want being made public about this trip? How about anything? <laughs> anything at all. Secret Service wants all this to be done in secret. So Eisenhower, who's planning this trip right after he wins the presidency, uh, he's planning it in secret so much so that officially he is to be at his New York address, 60 Morningside Drive, working on his cabinet. There would be releases put out while he is overseas that you're seeing these releases, oh, Eisenhower named so-and-so, he must, he must be in New York working because it, it's what it says. They're wanting this to be done in secret as much as possible because the president-elect will be traveling to an active war zone, something the United States Secret Service was not thrilled about. November 29th, 1952, Eisenhower begins his journey around the world. The traveling party will be going on two Lockheed Constellation planes. In Eisenhower's plane, he's accompanied by General Omar Bradley, West Point classmate, Major General Wilton Persons, Herbert Brownell, the incoming Attorney General, Charles Wilson, the incoming Secretary of Defense. There's a press contingent coming along in secret as well, including AP reporter Don Whitehead, who's pictured here. Whitehead's report on this trip, The Great Deception, won the 1953 Pulitzer Prize for national reporting. And through Whitehead and other press members who accompanied Eisenhower, we have some great uh, insight as to what took place on this journey. And I want to say this, because Whitehead in particular being on this is, is very telling. Uh, Don Whitehead was a famed reporter. And he had been among the first waves of those ashore on Omaha Beach on D-Day as a combat correspondent. His presence is one of many reminders during this journey that Dwight Eisenhower was a veteran of one war going to another active war zone trying to make sure that that second conflict did not become greater than the first. Everybody follow? On his trip to Korea, everywhere he looks, there's going to be reminders of the cost of war. And he's also followed by all these reminders of his own military career and the campaigns he's overseen on so many ways. So they begin this journey. I should say, Whitehead's report, the title up there, Two Men Step Out Into the Night, One is a General. That's how he began his, his report on the start of Eisenhower's trip. On his way over there, this was published afterwards. Uh, again, they didn't publish this when Ike left to show everybody the route he was going. Flies to San Francisco, flies to Honolulu, then he goes to Midway, reminder of the last war. He goes to this place here, Iwo Jima, excuse me, Iwo Jima, reminder of the last war. Gets there on December 1st and he spends the night on Iwo Jima with members of his traveling party looking out across the black sandy beaches where so many thousands of Marines were fighting and dying uh, 78 years ago right now, actually. While he was at Iwo Jima, he, Iwo Jima, excuse me, he made his way up to the top of Mount Suribachi where this famous photograph was taken, arguably the most famous photograph of the Second World War. And Eisenhower, in this AP photo, stood admiring the monument on top of Mount Suribachi. Now, he stayed in a, a Quonset hut on his, his one night in Iwo Jima. And uh, there's a rather amusing story where 45 minutes or so after he went to sleep, a captain named Wayne Melvin called the Quonset hut where Eisenhower was sleeping and woke him up. And the captain said, uh, well, where's, where's Colonel Weldon at? And Ike 
I don't know where he is. He's like, Do you, you sure you don't know where he is? No, I don't know where he is. And then this captain realized, oh, I just woke the president-elect up. <laughs> kind of an amusing anecdote. Eisenhower just laughed and hung up the phone. He wasn't one to hold a grudge. The next day, they're making their way to Korea for the final leg of their trip. Some members of the traveling party were seen changing into winter clothing before they arrived in Seoul on December 2nd of 1952. Because when they arrived there at 7.47 p.m. local time, it was 10 degrees above zero. And Dwight Eisenhower was not wearing that at the time. He was wearing a brown medium weight camel's hair jacket. I think one lesson we can draw from this exhibit of this parka, from this lecture, is never travel halfway around the world without planning for the weather, right? Because Eisenhower travels to Korea in winter, and he doesn't have any winter gear with him. United Press reporter Merriman Smith wrote, bitter cold night, particularly bitter for us without winter gear, which is necessary for survival in this detestably icy weather. Even at night, we could see the icy glaze on the rice paddies as we came in for our moonlight landing. Incoming Press Secretary James Haggerty wrote as the party uh, described as the party traveled through the war-torn streets of Seoul. Block after block of what had once been buildings were leveled flat. The Korean Capitol building was all shot up, bombed, and vacant. Now Eisenhower doesn't have time to do much on the evening of December 2nd. As you can imagine, he's exhausted. He has just traveled 10,000 miles. He briefly meets with General Mark Clark and General James Van Fleet, who, by the way, was a West Point classmate at 8th Army Headquarters. He has hot cocoa and a turkey sandwich, and he goes to bed. The next day, December 3rd, is the true begin, beginning of Eisenhower's experience in Korea. I want to also pause and thank the Eisenhower Presidential Library. Uh, they sent along 50 really high quality images. We're not going through all 50. Um, 50 really high quality images. This one has some markings of it, but images I had never seen before. U.S. Army Signal Corps photographs of Eisenhower's trip to Korea. So I'm going to sprinkle some of those through here uh, for a new look at this journey. UP, UP reporter Merriman Smith said of December 3rd, Eisenhower got his first real look at the war today. That morning of December 3rd, Eisenhower was outfitted with that jacket that you see right in front of you. Smith wrote, Eisenhower looked like an Arctic explorer in his fur cap and heavy winter jacket. <laughs> He also said the president-elect, as the day wore on, seemed to become more progressively and more serious and grim. A progressively more serious and grim. He spent the morning at 8th Army Headquarters with Clark and Van Fleet. The U.S. generals were pitching Eisenhower plans for expanding the war, expanding the offensive, taking the fight to communist forces in northern Korea. Later that day, Eisenhower met South Korean President Syngman Rhee, pictured here. This picture is actually from December 4th, but they actually first met on the evening of December 3rd. Now, Syngman Rhee is a fascinating figure in the history of the Korean War. He was imprisoned in his youth for anti-Japanese activities. He fled to the U.S. in 1904, went to U.S. universities, had an Ivy League education. He met Teddy Roosevelt, became friends with Woodrow Wilson, and he became a favorite of U.S. political leaders when it came to Korea in part because it was a Christian, in part because of his education, and in part because of the relationships that he built. So in 1948, when the U.S. is looking for someone to be the just right president of South Korea, he's the guy who wins. Now, Rhee was a hard anti-communist, and his government was guilty of many atrocities. There was atrocities on both sides of this conflict. I think one of the many reasons why it's something that's not well written about is it's such a grisly thing to read about uh, with all of the different stories coming out of this war. But Rhee's government uh, puts down numerous uprisings, uh, kills over 100,000 during the conflict. Rhee was vehemently opposed to the armistice talks going on, by the way. And that's something that will come out more and more. But Rhee also is very much pressing Eisenhower to have a renewed offensive, an expanded offensive to the north. And Eisenhower, as historian William Hitchcock would write, Eisenhower met these calls for a wider war with stony silence. That same day, December 3rd, Eisenhower met the men of the 1st Marine Division. Two years to the day after these men were bravely fighting their way out of Chinese lines in the Battle of the Chosin Reservoir. 
During the Korean War, the division lost over 4,000 dead and 25,000 plus wounded. UP reporter Merriman Smith wrote, probably the greatest burden on Eisenhower's shoulders was the widespread faith of the GI that the man could do something about ending the war. December 4th, the most thorough day of Eisenhower's visit in terms of actually getting out and seeing the men. Eisenhower is doing what he does best. He is meeting with soldiers at the front line of this war. He is being out in the cold with them, using that empathetic personal leadership style, the same one he employed in June of 1944 and so many other moments in his life. Here he is, pictured exploring and uh, surveying Republic of Korea forces. Here Eisenhower is seated watching a training exercise for ROK forces. And during his journeys, he was taking this L-19 puddle jumper plane around Korea. You can understand why the Secret Service were not wild about this. The president-elect, in frigid temperature, so cold that at one place, the, uh, the unit band was ready to play to receive the president-elect, and they had a hard time because their mouthpieces were frozen. <laughs> During his journeys, uh, he is meeting with members of the 3rd Infantry Division, which 12 years earlier, Eisenhower, as a lieutenant colonel, commanded the, third, uh, the 15th Infantry Regiment within the 3rd Infantry Division. And there he sees his son, John Eisenhower. So this is a newspaper image of Ike and John shaking hands. This is a high-quality photograph. This is John Eisenhower here. Why John wasn't looking at the camera in this picture, I don't know. But uh, this is Ike and John, the highest quality photograph I could find of the two of them. You're just going gonna to have to take my word for it that that is John looking away. But you can see these small little planes. The president-elect traveling around in a war zone in the winter time with these icy runways. Look at this. That does not seem like a very uh, safe and secure environment. He's hearing the echoes of artillery fire, by the way, throughout his day visiting units. Don Whitehead would write, Eisenhower's son, Major John Eisenhower, was assigned his father's aide during his tour of Korea. Smith, Merriman Smith, noted, if there was a bright spot in Eisenhower's day, it was seeing John again. Now, on this day of December 4th, Eisenhower meets, again, members of the 3rd Infantry Division, and he has lunch with these guys. It's, uh, I think, my favorite story from his trip to Korea. While Clark Van Fleet, this is what Whitehead writes, while Clark Van Fleet and the other generals and VIPs went into a mess tent for lunch, Eisenhower sat on a pine box in the near zero weather to eat and chat with members of the 3rd Infantry Division. Here he's going through the mess line and he's getting pork chops and sauerkraut, in case you're wondering what a president-elect eats at the front lines of a war zone. You can see the steam rising off the food. At one point, an officer, an aide, comes up to Eisenhower and he taps him on the shoulder and, uh, General Eisenhower, there's a space inside for you. What do you think Ike said about that? He said, what, with all that brass in there? No, I'm good right here. I'm good right here where I am. Eisenhower wrote, it was an interesting meal, even though the thermometer was registering sub-freezing temperatures. The men freely told me about their daily lives in that mountainous and exposed terrain and described the discomfort they suffered because of the cold and the difficulty of maintaining underground shelters in decent conditions. I would say this, this might be one of the most widely circulated photographs of Eisenhower's trip to Korea, and it's such a wonderful example of who Eisenhower was as a person. It's one of the things that we take great pride in being able to tell the story of at Eisenhower National Historic Site. When you tour the Eisenhower home, uh, yeah, it's the home of a president, and there's some pretty fancy presidential gifts and items in there. But most of the house, you're looking at a place of a guy who would rather sit outside and eat pork chops off a tray with men uh, who they'd be eating outside anyway. So he's going to go ahead and join them and be there with them in that experience. And that's why I used the word empathetic leadership to describe Eisenhower, because he was one who really worked to get to know people throughout his life and career. It's one of the things that made him who he was. December 5th, the last day of his visit to Korea, Eisenhower is pictured here, excuse me, pictured here with the men of the 2nd Infantry Division. Don Whitehead wrote of that day, the general's third day in Korea was reserved for a news conference and further talks with Chase and other military men. He refused to talk politics and concentrated on the problems of peace. 
In Eisenhower's news conference, he noted how difficult it seems to be in a war of this kind, to work out a plan that would bring a positive and definite victory without possibly running grave risk of enlarging the war. And that same day, you see here Eisenhower leaning out of his Jeep, shaking hands with enlisted men of the 2nd Infantry Division. That same day, Eisenhower prepared to depart. He reflected much on his trip to Korea. He had lots of time to reflect on his way back. But before departing, he was again pressed to expand this war, to have an expanded and renewed offensive north to try to reclaim the Korean Peninsula. Eisenhower, though, was not convinced. My conclusion as I left Korea was that we could not stand forever on a static front and continue to accept casualties without any visible results. Small attacks on small hills would not end this war. Don Whitehead would write, Eisenhower found Korea raw and cold, heaped with the dead and the rubble of war, a waif among nations shivering in its winter's sorrow. He won the Pulitzer Prize for a reason, folks. If he found a way to stop the slaughter, he did not say so. The first American president elect to trod a smoking battlefield, Eisenhower came, saw, and departed. He talked with the generals and soldiers on high and low ranks, bunkered against sleet, snow, and wind in the razor-edged mountains. And on December 5th, he made his way to Guam, where he boarded the USS Helena, a 17,000-ton cruiser. President-elect Eisenhower rode a battle-scarred heavy cruiser toward storm-whipped seas today with a, hand, a head full of impressions and a pocket full of suggestions on what to do about the Korean War. The leader eight years ago in Europe of the mightiest army the world had known planned to mull over the information he gathered on his Korean mission. Now on their way, Heading back to the United States, Eisenhower has many members who had formed his presidential team, his presidential administration on board. They had kind of a floating uh, planning conference, if you will, in the Pacific, planning things like the budget, what to do about Korea, what people to put in key positions in the cabinet. But it wasn't all work. On his way, they're also skeet shooting off the back of the ship in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So the skeet range was not the only place where Eisenhower did that, the skeet range we have uh, at Eisenhower National Historic Site. I should say, after 30 minutes of skeet shooting off the back of the Helena in the middle of the Pacific, Ike had a perfect score. So not too shabby. On December 11th, pictured here, Eisenhower arrived at Pearl Harbor. Again, reminded of the costs of the last war. While he was in Hawaii, Truman held a news conference where he called Eisenhower's trip a piece of political demagoguery, which greatly angered the incoming president. A news article wrote that, quote, just about killed any chance of friendly relations between the two in the future. Several days later, Eisenhower is back in New York, arriving at LaGuardia Airport. And on his way across the Pacific, his team and his speechwriters had been working on a formal address, a formal set of remarks, I should say, a formal statement. When Eisenhower arrived at LaGuardia, he gave some informal comments at first before this formal statement was given. And I should say, in addition to this parka, uh, the Gettysburg Foundation also acquired two drafts of this statement that Eisenhower worked on on his way back across the Pacific on the Helena. Um, these are images of the first pages of both of those drafts. The statement did not have a lot of rhetorical flourish to it. Uh, it was more or less recapping some of the things that Eisenhower had seen in Korea. He said that he believed peace could be achieved, that the men on the front lines were supplied very well. He left with a great faith and pride in the fighting man on the front lines of the Korean War. He said that the Republic of Korea forces should continue to train and take over responsibilities as much as they could. And he also was important to note, he said, quote, finally, we must all recognize in our thinking and our planning that the Korean War is but the most dramatic and most painful phase for us at this moment of our worldwide struggle against communist aggression. Well, just about a month later, Eisenhower goes from president-elect thinking about what he's going to do to being on the clock as president of the United States. It is now very much his responsibility. Pictured here are Dwight Eisenhower and Vice President Richard Nixon with Dorothy Maynard singing the national anthem at their inauguration 70 years ago, January 20th of 1953. 
Eisenhower's first inaugural had some rhetorical flourish to it, to it. My fellow citizens, the world and we have passed the midway point of a century of continuing challenge. We sense with all our faculties that forces of good and evil are massed, massed and armed and opposed as rarely before in history. He spoke of this challenge of facing threats across the world and noted that the country had faced these challenges for several decades already in the 20th century, as Eisenhower himself was very much aware. As he said, we have grown in power and in responsibility. We have passed through the anxieties of depression and of war to a summit unmatched in man's history. Seeking to secure peace in the world, we have had to fight through the forests of the Argonne to the shores of Iwo Jima and to the cold mountains of Korea. We shall never try to placate an aggressor by the false and wicked bargain of trading honor for security. Americans, indeed all free men, remember that in the final choice, a soldier's pack is not so heavy a burden as a prisoner's chains. So he's still framing Korea as part of this global struggle between freedom and communism. Now, he's been there. He's seen the front lines. He doesn't think a renewed offensive on the ground, putting more soldiers into the fight, is going to work. Okay, Ike, so what's your plan? Well, again, remember, by this point, the negotiations for an armistice have been going on for almost two years while there's fighting, while there are soldiers fighting and dying on the front lines of this conflict. There is one major sticking point still left in 1953 when Eisenhower takes over, and that is what to do with prisoners of war who don't exactly want to go back to North Korea or go back to China. U.S. and U.N. officials were not going to forcibly repatriate prisoners of war who did not want to go back to their home countries. This was a sticking point. February of 1943, Eisenhower wanted to discreetly let the Chinese know that unless armistice negotiations moved forward, the United States would, quote, move decisively without inhibition in our use of weapons. Now, MacArthur wanted to publicly threaten and actually take the war to China using a bombing campaign and possibly even nuclear weapons. Eisenhower actually met with MacArthur right after he came back from Korea, and he told MacArthur he wasn't going to do that. But privately, Eisenhower is using this threat to help move things along. And this is what Stephen Ambrose wrote. The Chinese were fully aware that in the war against Germany, Eisenhower had used every weapon at his disposal. They knew that he had atomic weapons available in the East, that he would not accept a stalemate, and that he was not demanding their unconditional surrender, but only that they agree to an armistice. The substance behind Eisenhower's threats was, America's repu was Eisenhower's reputation, backed by America's atomic arsenal. Now, this applied domestically as well. Eisenhower was perhaps the only politician in America who can in could continue engaging in these negotiations with communists and survive the political fallout. When Eisenhower runs for president, he has some unique political capital to spend, and he spends some of it in his first year in office. In March of 1953, Joseph Stalin dies. That is a major breakthrough moment for this, as without Stalin, the Soviets are now not quite as keen anymore on continuing this fight. They are now more open to a negotiated end as well. In April, there's an exchange of sick and wounded prisoners known as Operation Little Switch that suggests positions on both sides might be coming closer to the middle. In the midst of all this, this man, Sigmund Rhee, is vehemently against any negotiated end to this conflict that does not lead to the Korean Peninsula united and him in charge. Many members of Eisenhower's administration were against a negotiated armistice. Many members of Eisenhower's political party were against a negotiated armistice. This deck is stacked against Eisenhower in many ways. Rhee is telling Eisenhower that South Korea would ask her allies to leave and prepare to push north to the Yalu River, the border with China, on its own rather than sign an armistice. Eisenhower's response was, quote, any such action by your government could only result in disaster for your country. Rhee at one point tries to sabotage the armistice negotiations by releasing 25,000 prisoners of war into the countryside. Eisenhower was furious. Ike wrote to Rhee reminding him that UN forces had authority during the conflict. Him releasing those POWs was a violation of that. 
Quote, unless you are prepared immediately and unequivocally to accept the authority of the UN command to conduct the present hostilities and to bring them to a close, it will be necessary to effect another arrangement. Dwight Eisenhower's reputation meant that these words carried a lot of weight with Syngman Rhee and the South Koreans. They were not thrilled about it, but ultimately armistice negotiations continued. On July 1st, Eisenhower said he was hopeful for an armistice at a news conference. Ike was told of the eventual signing of the armistice on July 26th. Agreements were reached involving neutral third parties so that prisoners of war who did not want to go back would not be forcibly repatriated. In Eisenhower's address, he said, We have won an armistice on a single battleground, not peace in the world. We may not now relax our guard nor cease our quest. But was it a victory? For the Historian has a wide variety of titles, new and used, of military books from publishers like Osprey, Gettysburg Publishing, Stackpole, Savis Beatty, UNC Press, and more. I make it a point to go there once a week because I have new bookshelves to fill and I never know what treasures I'll find, and neither will you. They even have toy soldiers, model kits, games, children's books, and more. So stop by and check them out on your next visit to Gettysburg, or better yet, order right now online at ForTheHistorian.com and mention that you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg in the Note to Seller box, and they will refund you your shipping. And if you call 717-685-5207 or stop by the store on your next visit and mention us, you'll get 20% off retail price. That's ForTheHistorian.com or 717-685-5207. If you're a lover of history, then go to trhistorical.com. There you'll find apparel, decor, and gear, and our listeners will receive 10% off plus free shipping within the U.S. if you use promo code GBERG1863 at checkout. So take advantage of this deal at trhistorical.com. TR Historical, for the love of history. You've heard us promote various ways that you can help us keep the show going, but one way we haven't pushed too much is our sutlery at AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. That's a shame because we have designs over there by talented artists like Ty DeWitt of 1863 Designs and Mike Stretch of the Heritage Depot. So now we're promoting it. Buying shirts, hoodies, mugs, and other items from our sutlery not only helps us keep the lights on, but it also helps guys like Ty and Mike, and it helps spread the word about the show every time you wear an item or you sip from your mug. So head over to AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop and grab some merch. It's the perfect Christmas gift for the Gettys nerd in your family. That's AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. Hey, Gettysburg business owners. Winter is just around the bend, and you know what that means. No tourists. But just because people aren't coming to you doesn't mean you can't bring your business to them. If you ship, you're still in the game. And if you're a seasonal business, the time to advertise for your next season is in the off-season when people are making their plans. So what's an affordable yet highly effective way of reaching those people? Well, it's not radio. It's not TV, and it's certainly not print. Step out of the Jurassic era of advertising and run an ad on Addressing Gettysburg. We just reached 1 million downloads, and we're growing by the tens of thousands every month. Beyond that, our audience is happy to support those who support their favorite podcast. So email sales at Addressing Gettysburg for more information about advertising on our show. We look forward to helping your business grow. That's sales at AddressingGettysburg.com. What is a victory in this context? It's a very noble undertaking that Eisenhower went on, going to Korea and trying to find a way to bring this, this fight to a close. Was it a victory? Well, as in so many things in history, depends on who you ask. The peace was not popular at home. Stephen Ambrose would write, there were no victory celebrations, no cheering crowds in Times Square, no sense of triumph. Now pictured here, American aviators very much in a sense of triumph in Korea upon being told of the armistice. Right next to them, mourning Koreans in Seoul in the fall of 1953, mourning the thousands and thousands that they had lost, and also mourning that their, their country was still divided. It was not united as a result of this conflict. So what does all of this mean? Korea and Eisenhower's administration, this trip, and yes, this parka that you see in front of the theater. It was part of Dwight Eisenhower's work 
to wage peace, something that he did throughout his, his uh, presidency. Eisenhower believed the Korean War armistice was one of his greatest achievements. He sought peace when many told him to keep fighting. He defied members of his own cabinet, his own party, as well as South Korean leaders to seek this armistice. But why would a former general crusade for peace? Stephen Ambrose wrote, The Supreme Allied Commander of 1945, the victor who would accept nothing less than unconditional surrender, had become the peacemaker of 1950. Three, a man who would accept a compromise settlement that left him far short of victory, much less unconditional surrender. He also said Eisenhower realized that unlimited war in the nuclear age was unimaginable and limited war was unwinnable. Eisenhower was not about to see this turn into a nuclear conflict or World War III. Eisenhower liked to make up lists in his diary. From the end of 1953 onward, whenever he listed the achievements he was proudest of, he always began with peace in Korea. It was not a perfect armistice, far from it. It was one that the South Korean people mourned. It left the front lines of this, this struggle much as they had been at the start with the 38th parallel being a dividing point. Three million people had died, over three million total, between all the various countries involved in this war and what came of it. Why did Eisenhower do this? Certainly it was far from perfect. But few understood better the ability of war to eliminate tyranny while also grasping the total cost of war itself. Eisenhower was one who understood that. This is Eisenhower at Arlington in 1958 when he oversaw the entombment of two uh, unknown soldiers from World War II and from Korea. Here he's presenting the Medal of Honor on one of the caskets. Eisenhower hosted wounded veterans at the White House as president. He presided over the inclusion of fallen World War II and Korean dead at the Tomb of the Unknown. He knew what death was like. When his son Icky died, Eisenhower was right there. He knew that as president, he had an atomic arsenal of over 1,600 weapons, and he had the ability to either save or destroy millions of people. This piece was a complicated choice. There is no such thing as a 100% win when you're president of the United States. But Eisenhower ultimately feared the truth, the one that's been said, uh, quoted so many times from George Santayana, only the dead are safe, only the dead have seen the end of war. He did this because of his experience in his lifetime, knowing that it wasn't perfect, but it was a way to help mitigate the loss and help to bring some American soldiers home. He did this because of places like Gettysburg National Cemetery, near the farm he had hoped to retire to, but instead found himself on those icy runways in a puddle jumper wearing that coat in Korea. As I noted earlier, Gettysburg National Cemetery has fallen service members from the Civil War through the Vietnam conflict. Among them, at least two dozen who were killed in Korea, men like Private First Class Aloysius L. Zonka, a Lansford, Pennsylvania native who served as a medic in Korea. Aloysius was rejected for service in World War II because of a defect in his heel. After World War II, when standards were lax, he enlisted. His hometown newspaper noted that uh, to Six years ago, every branch of the armed forces told a patriotic young Lansford boy that he was physically unfit for military duty. Today, that same youth lies buried in the rocky soil of a Korean battleground. Private First Class Zonka gave his life there, proving to his country and himself that he was a good soldier. Eisenhower did the armistice for him. He did the armistice and sought the armistice for Bernard Stavely, who was the seventh member of his family to serve in the United States Marine Corps. He was killed September 1st of 1950, and at his funeral, seven of his family members wore their Marine uniforms. He did it for William Gormley, another Lansford native. He was killed September of 1950. His parents' names were Frank and Olivia. For Corporal William Mulcrone, a World War II veteran who had fought from Anzio through the final push into Germany under Eisenhower's command, but still re-enlisted in 1948. He was killed September 5th, 19, excuse me, September 6th, 1950, the day before his 33rd birthday. Because of Louis Di Camillo, who has a memory stone here in Gettysburg National Cemetery. Louis was serving under Lieutenant Colonel Don Faith in December 
of 1950 at the Chosin Reservoir. They were encircled by Chinese forces. Faith and many under his command were killed trying to get back to U.S. lines. Lewis's body was never recovered, but he has a stone here in Gettysburg. Because of Colonel John Lovell, the highest ranking U.S. intelligence officer lost during the war, who also has a memory stone here in Gettysburg National Cemetery. Here's Lewis. John Lovell was shot down in December of 1950, two years to the day, December 4th, 1950, two years to the day before Eisenhower was in Korea. He was interrogated by Russians, handed over to a mob in North Korea wearing a sign saying U.S. War, war Criminal, and he was never seen again. Because of Private First Class James Leroy Franklin, who was killed in action January 1st of 1951, the same day that the Gettysburg Times thought that the Eisenhowers might be moving here. Because of Charles Frederick Meisner, who was killed sem uh, September of 1951. Because of Levi Comer Altland, pictured here. Levi served in the Navy for three years in World War II. He was a Gettysburg High School graduate from 1943. Ultimately, he went on to study after World War II. For a year, he studied at my alma mater of Hillsdale College, and then he finished out his college career at Gettysburg College. He re-enlisted in the Army. He was killed November 1951. And he also did it because of Corporal James Murray. James Murray was a native of Porham, Oklahoma. <clears throat> he had an eighth grade education. And by December of 1952, he had been wounded three times and was a Bronze Star recipient. He was due to come home from Korea at the end of December. He served in the 3rd Infantry Division. He was one of those guys that Ike had lunch with. On December 4th of 1952, wearing that jacket, Eisenhower sat right next to Corporal James Murray and had lunch. Five days later, Murray was killed in action. His commanding officer, Lieutenant John Richards, said he was one of the finest soldiers I've ever known, and you can write that in letters of gold. When Murray was killed, it's Murray. When Murray was killed, Ike was on his way home on the USS Helena, and he issued a statement. I am grieved by the report that Corporal Murray has been killed in action. I have fine memories of our brief friendship. He was a splendid young soldier, typical of thousands of our young men who are fighting in faraway Korea for the principles all, American cher all Americans cherish and for a just peace. My profound sympathies go to his family. Ike didn't meet any of the young men buried here in Gettysburg, but he did meet James Murray. He had lunch with them, and five days later he was killed. So why did he pursue this unpopular, complicated armistice? For guys like him. Eisenhower would write in Mandate of Change when speaking of Murray, war is the saddest of all human activities. And when he took the oath of office, he raised the same hand that had just shaken hands with Murray about a month earlier. Think about that, wearing that coat. Again, Murray's death was not the only one in Korea, but he was one that Ike had met. And for someone who thrived on that interpersonal leadership style, that empathetic leadership style, that really mattered for Dwight Eisenhower. And that sacrifice and so many others shaped what he did over his presidency. I think this story is fascinating in so many ways for a life of Eisen for Eisenhower's life, one that we focus so much on his activities in waging war. It's worth noting that Eisenhower said the greatest cause of his life was the cause of peace. He said that when he said he would be going to Korea. And this parka here that we have on display is, is part of that story. This is the parka that Eisenhower wore to protect himself from the elements when, again, I'm sure he would have rather been here in Gettysburg. I know I would have. But instead, he was in sub-zero temperature in a dangerous war zone trying to find a way forward because of all the guys we just heard about and because of Corporal James Murray. And I'll end on a, on a reflective and positive note, thinking about what our crusades might be in our day and what the, what the uh, consequences of our own actions might be, the things that we pursue, the things that we value, and you never know who they'll impact. Uh, this is a picture of my wife's grandfather, Alfred Konarski, he was serving in country in Korea when Eisenhower was there, and he got to come home because of that journey. 
thank you all for being here today. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for taking part in programming here at Gettysburg. If anyone has questions, I will be happy to do my best. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? It's a little bit off topic, but what precipitated Ike to choose Nixon as his VP? What caught the, the Nixon choice as VP? I think it was someone that conservative members of the party were more comfortable with, and it also provided some geographic balance with Nixon being from California. And also he's a much younger figure, so it's a balance on num numerous levels. Yeah. Eisenhower is, is known for his positions kind of in the stratosphere of leadership. So it made sense for him to be chosen as commander of NATO. But was there ever any talk of him being chosen to lead UN forces in Korea? You know, I don't think so. Because um, the NATO the NATO selection happens right as he's asked right before China gets involved in the war. Um, and I think the, the thinking was with Marshall as Secretary of Defense, MacArthur was still the overall commander at that point. MacArthur had been assuring Truman that, oh, the Chinese aren't going to get involved. Don't, don't worry about that. Uh, they, they met at Wake Island in October of 50. And MacArthur told him there was no prospects for that. And we'll be done by Thanksgiving. And then so I think he had already been asked by the time MacArthur was relieved. He was already serving in NATO command. And also, he was very comfortable in, in Europe, uh, having, having been there during, during the, the wartime years, six, six, seven years earlier. Yeah. You spoke about uh, Truman's response to Eisenhower's trip and how it kind of became a chilling dividing line between. Can you speak to that a little bit more? Well, I'll say that Inauguration Day 1953 was not a very warm and friendly place. Uh, they didn't speak much. I, I believe the only interaction they had, Ike more or less asked Truman uh, who ordered that John, because John came home for the inauguration. He said, who, who ordered John to be here? And Truman said, well, I did that. I thought a son should see his father get sworn in. But um, beyond that, not many pleasantries were exchanged. Um, and they were already... They were already tense. Truman had tried to recruit Eisenhower to run for the Democrats. And he had the sense that Ike was not going to run at all. When he ran as a Republican, Truman took it personally. And in the campaigning, uh, you know, presidential elections are nasty things. Uh, there are things said that upset both of them. So uh, the relationship had already deteriorated. It was a friendly one. You saw earlier the photograph of Truman pinning a medal on Eisenhower in June of 45. A very different relationship in 1953. They would eventually, they would see each other at funerals um, after, after Inauguration Day. They eventually actually had a little uh, bearing of the hatchet, so to speak. Um, after Kennedy's assassination, they, they met after the JFK's funeral at Blair House and had, I believe, tea and sandwiches together. And I think that's the last time they saw each other. But uh, the, the relationship was already fraught with tension. So, yes? If, if conventional war is unwinnable, have you given any thought to how Eisenhower may have handled what's going on in Ukraine? Well, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> yes, sir. So would you say that there was a good portion um, from the presidential administration of Eisenhower forward in dealing with the Soviets and the Cold War of luck? I know McNamara talks a lot about luck, and I would think, as you mentioned, Stalin dying and certain things taking place allowed Eisenhower to move forward in that decision because this is – this is proof in the pudding of the Truman Doctrine, and any president after Truman that's being seen as being soft on communism um, is detrimental to their own administration. So Kennedy experienced that, Johnson experienced that, you know, and that was that was always something that would play in the back of any president's head, regardless of agenda. You know, am I being soft on communism? So would you say that it was a yeah, I mean, luck is whether it's it's warfare or right. diplomacy or all of these things. Um, 
the death of Stalin, you know, there's a very good question if this armistice happens, if Stalin doesn't die in March of 53. So yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very big role. I mean, whether you think about um, you know, Eisenhower's administration and his various dealings, or I mean, uh, the, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis and, JF, crisis and JFK, you don't have to say there's quite a bit of, of luck involved in that with how uh, that played out. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Um, it was it, it's such a complex thing. This is not you know Ike goes to Korea and we win the war a hundred percent. You know the armistice comes about in part because well largely because of his visit, but also there's other elements as well. So yeah, absolutely. So we'll take uh, take one or uh, yes, sir. Could you tell us a little bit about the path of the coat itself? I mean, did he wear it again? And, and I, I don't know that he wore it again. I believe he gave it to his dentist when he got back. <laughs> I'm looking over here at some of my colleagues getting a nod, head nod yes. So I guess it's, hey, thanks for capping that molar. By the way, forgot my wallet, but do you accept parkas? I don't think he didn't actually do that. But I, I believe that's, that's, that's the, the path of it. So, yeah. I don't know what happened to the hat. If we had the hat, I probably would have worn it for the program. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So uh, we'll do one more, and then uh, yes, sir. Did the armistice result in a rather quick troop withdrawal, or how long did that sort of take? You know, that's that's a good question. Obviously, we still have troops there. Um, I, I don't know how quickly the the withdrawal happened. That's a good question. Um, I can say I know in. In the case of, uh, of Alfred here, he came home in later 1953, um, but I, I could not say how quickly the withdrawal happened. That's something I'd have to look into. That's a good question. So, Again, thank you all for coming today. If anyone would like to uh, come take a look, you're more than welcome to. Thank you for being here. Need a core badge or other insignia for your uniform? Then check out the badge maker. Here's what some of his satisfied customers had to say. Miranda said, I ordered an identification disc from Joe and it's fantastic. He hand stamped it exactly as I wanted. Greg said, my unit has purchased from him in the past quality badges and good service. And Jerry S. says, the badge maker is the go-to place for accurate replica Civil War badges. So go to CivilWarCoreBadges.com and attach a message with your order saying you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg. Our hearts so stout have got a fame for soon to spill from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down, and pay the reckoning on the nail. No man for that shall go to jail from Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down.